The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Good morning. Good morning again, and welcome. Uh, if at first you don't succeed, uh, we try, try again. Good morning, and welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. Look who's here with me Good live. Good morning, everyone. It's our first live show in the studio with it you is, in it 2023. It doesn't seem true. like it because it feels like so much water has gone I underneath know, the bridge. Honestly. But it's our first live show with Dr. Doreen here in the studio, so we're excited. We're live. I don't even know what today's date is. It's like. I, what is it? I it's have no the, idea. It's, it's the 17th. I can't believe that. I was just going to say, it's like the 13th. It's the <laughs> 17th. Where did that happen? Uh, but so here we are, and we're excited to be here with you guys live in 2023. If you don't know Dr. Grand Pichet and you didn't recognize from the opener, she's a true expert in the field of autism. I believe the preeminent expert in our time and what other time is there in the field <laughs> of autism, right? And uh, she's been working in this field for more than 40 years, four zero. I didn't say 14, four zero years, yep. helping all kinds of individuals on the spectrum and, in, and including in that conversation, people who love and care about people on the spectrum, the Definitely. caregivers and the siblings and the boyfriends and girlfriends and significant others and aunts and uncles and grandparents, right? So she's been an amazing service to our community, seeing individuals mm -hmm. and not seeing a diagnosis, uh, although she is capable of giving diagnoses. We've been in lots of conversations in the last week about who can diagnose and who can't. Oh. She can. She, <laughs> she's allowed to say, but you would never disclose somebody's diagnosis publicly. Oh, no, of course not. That's private business. Right. Like anything else. Right. You know, uh, I, I, I've had people saying, you know, oh, so-and-so diagnosing people that they see on television. Oh, oh. And I'm like, well, you know, that's really not the behavior no. we want to emulate, right? Um, it's not that it's anything to be embarrassed about or be shy about, but we don't, I'm no, not qualified very... to di diagnose. And you, who is qualified to diagnose, would never diagnose someone. Oh, it's a very private, yes. confidential thing, right? Of it's course. like your pap smear results. Nothing to be ashamed <laughs> of, but you don't have people going and telling it on uh, at a party or an, uh, you know, you on national television. Well, people get fatutzed about certain things and, and they'll say so-and-so. Uh, we have a video that gets a lot of attention uh -huh. that is titled, Stop Saying That Baron Trump Has Autism. Oh, yes, of course, yes. And yes. every once in a while it rears its, its head and it gets back into right. the public. And right. I came forward all those years ago and said, could we stop? Right. Let's not, let's. How about if we don't diagnose someone else's child? Honestly, can honestly. we just behave ourselves? That's not what we would want for our children. But then every once in a while, people step forward and say, "What's so bad about saying that?" It you know, it's clear to me, and and I always I just mean, say it's not up to us to diagnose, and it's certainly not up to us to publicly be diagnosing someone. It's no, just bad behavior. Yeah, and even if it was, it's, it's funny because. A long time ago, like when he came into the spotlight, a yes. lot of people asked me, I'm sure. Do you think he's autistic? Oh, yeah. And first of all, you never really diagnose someone based on a couple of, you know, clips that you see on TV or something. Yeah, something That's, that you saw at two in the morning. Hello. Uh, or just any, <laughs> like, the, you know, you, know you, you just don't do that. And right. um, it takes a lot more observation and assessment to diagnose someone. Which would be consideration for that individual. Well, and you can't just throw out a diagnosis based on a one-time observation. You right. just don't do that. But it's funny because I remember when people were asking me and I just yeah. happened to see him on TV, Yeah, I saw certain behaviors that would be very contrary oh. to the diagnosis. <laughs> and I was like, you know, if I was going to engage in that discussion, which I don't, yeah. Yeah, 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 I yeah. would say, no, he definitely doesn't. So well, there we go. Funny, yeah. There we go. 
So anyway, but she is capable of diagnosing. That's how we got into that little loop of conversation. Yes. And, uh, but she does all kinds of other things and has done all kinds of other things and continues to do all kinds of other things. <laughs> and we adore you for it. Thank you. And I, I'm, I, I'm like, I, I, I always want to say this, that I'm president of your fan club, but that's it's like I'm saying you. that euphemistically. But I should be. I should start thank a fan club so and be president of it. <laughs> um, because I would be. I would want to be president of it because... Your work has directly impacted my life, my Thank personal you, home life, um, that my son was treated by you and a core of people that you trained. Right. And, um, and I'm forever grateful for that. Thank and I you think very the world is, is filled with not enough people who have experienced that, unfortunately. Right, true. But what I love is that she donates this time every week so that you guys can have, a, it's like a mini meeting with her that you can write in questions right now live and ask her uh, whatever you would like to ask her and we'll try to answer as many questions. Absolutely. I printed out stuff but I realized that I did not print out uh, the question that I was supposed to print out, Traven, which was our starter question. Mm. It's completely escaped my mind too and I had it somewhere and I don't know what I did with it. So maybe Traven can tell me in my ear what that was. But in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and launch in because we had a topic and I had a first question. Well, you may have sent it to me. It's in the it's in the <coughs> the description, the rundown for the on the calendar. Oh, I see. Which I'm okay. not able to get in, in in this iteration. So, uh Traven will tell me. So I have one from Friday. Oh, how can we tell if our child's health issues are impeding their are progress. impeding their progress. Thank you. Right. That's what the topic is, and it's an important one and something that you feel very it's passionately about. It's a about. really great subject. I'm yeah. really glad that somebody asked that question. It's it's so important. Yeah. Um, because you know I very strongly believe that our kids we have to pay attention to how they feel. Yes. Before we try to like throw massive amounts of intervention at them. It's so simplistic <coughs> and yeah. it so, makes it's, so it's, much sense so that you simple. go, duh, well, yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely, right? And you see sometimes uh, with younger behaviorists, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, not thinking about that. Yeah. And, and they think, you know, because when you're a young behaviorist and you're just starting to take on patients of your own, I think you ha kind of have a little point to prove like mm. beha ABA works you yeah. know and you're trying very very hard and when it doesn't work you feel like that is a bad reflection on you mm. and it's not necessarily I mean it certainly could be and there are obviously times when I've seen someone do wrong techniques not reinforce enough not shape enough not fade enough yeah. whatever it might be within ABA but I think a lot of times the child is just not feeling well yeah. or it has some other comorbid issue going on which is impeding their ability to sit and learn. Yeah. So those are, to me, it's very, very important to pay attention to those things. And I guess the answer to how do you know... Yeah, how can you tell? Right. Is if those things are happening outside of therapy, right? So okay. in other words, your child's not sleeping, I mm -hmm. guarantee you they're not at, the, at, at 100%. Just Medically. The, the, uh, no, of, of the ability to function. I see. Like, if, like, Shannon, you know, you and I, any of us, oh. if you don't sleep well, you are not at 100% the next day. That's yeah. just a given, right? And if you're not at 100%, that means that you're learning a certain percentage of what's going on around you, but you could do better. Yeah. Right? So sleep becomes a very, very important factor. If you have, it's funny because as I, you know, not that our viewers need to know this, but I was struggling with norovirus the last week. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you have stuff going on in your stomach, for instance, uh, you are definitely not functioning well enough to be learning new material. Oh my God. If you don't feel well, if you have yeah. pain, if you have... Uh, any kind of GI distress, which we know now there's a yeah. huge number of kids who do have gastrointestinal distress, yeah. then I don't know how we expect that child to sit and learn new material. Remember, learning new material is learning new material. Yeah. It's like, you know, do, would you pick up learning a new task <laughs> when you're not feeling well? Probably yeah. not. 
So if those things are going on outside of therapy, right? Like you see that the child is uh, just struggling because they're in pain, struggling because they're tired, those types of things, yeah. you automatically should be sure that this is also impeding therapy. Yeah. Okay. Now, if they're not, if it is, it's happening, but it's not to a point where it's noticeable, mm -hmm. then I think it's a good practice to always just go through like a checklist when your child's uh, in an intervention program. Mm -hmm. Like, did he, like, did he sleep well last night? This yeah. is one of the things that I loved about the, the, you know, the multidisciplinary timeline that we built on skills. Yeah. When we uh, built the, the you know, skills, which was our curriculum at CARD, and then it was a data tracking system, one of the things I just like loved about this was I insisted and we put in this timeline, which would graphed your child's progress, so like how much they were learning every day, um, as well as how many challenging behaviors they had. Yeah. But then on top of that, you could put external events. Yeah. For instance, you know, did the child not sleep last night? Did the child start a new medication? Did the child um, have Did the a, dog die? Did the dog die? Did something traumatic yeah. happen? Did the yeah. family move? Did whatever it is, yeah. because all of those external factors will influence learning, yeah. right? They will just influence how the child's doing. So as long as you keep that in your mind and you have your behaviorists or whoever's working with the child just do a checklist, you know, yeah. did anything unusual happen yesterday that he's not learning today? I always, I always ask the teams. Yeah. So let's see, was he sleeping okay? Has he been sick? Has he started a new medication? Is there something different in his diet? Yeah. These are all very important things to ask. One of the things that I, I think is that, the, I don't want to generalize, but the, the medical field in general, I'm going to go ahead and generalize, um, sometimes they kind of norm things out for our kids. Mm -hmm. Like there was somebody who wrote in last week and was talking about the fact that their child has had diarrhea their whole life oh, yeah. and, so from birth. <coughs> and I think that sometimes the pediatricians will act like, well, yeah, you know, because they have autism yes. instead of continuing to work on it. And then we as parents don't know, yeah. oh, if my child has had diarrhea for two years That's very or six yeah. years or whatever, I would say, uh, and I'm going to use a term that a friend of mine uses, imagine if you were trying to learn calculus while you had the squirts. Exactly. It, it would be infinitely I mean, hard. <clears throat> and, let's, and calculus is probably equally as complex as the English language. Oh, absolutely. Come on. And, and we're not even talking about the discomfort of having oh, diarrhea. We're yeah. talking about the nutritional imbalance that occurs yeah. with our kids over years of being sick like this, yeah. right? I do remember, I remember, I w you know, I, I was doing a diagnosis years and years ago, and um, this, pa this family was a friend of one of our supervisors, so mm -hmm. I was trying to spend a lot of time and help yeah. them as much as I could, and so we spent a couple of hours just talking so that I could evaluate the child, and honestly, at the end of the two hours, like there were two hours we were talking about this child and there was no mention of any of the gastrointestinal distress. Yeah. And then all of a sudden at the end, I was like, so is there anything we've not talked about? Yeah. And uh, mom said, well, yeah, he also has diarrhea, like, yeah. you know, three times a day, four times a day. I was like, how long is that? And when she told me, and she sa I said, how come you didn't mention that before? Yeah. And she said, because I took him to a gastroenterologist, and yeah. the gastroenterologist, pediatric gastroenterologist, said that's just part of the autism. Yeah. And it absolutely is not. It is comorbid. It's a different issue when you have to deal with it, right? Autism is so kind of pervasive. It, o it takes over so many different areas of functioning that it overshadows these yeah. other things. Like if it was any other child and they weren't sleeping, something as simple as that, yeah. we would say immediately there's a sleep issue, there's a sleep disorder, we gotta yeah. deal with that. But, you know, or an allergy or something like that. Yeah. But with autism, we, we attribute all these other things to autism and it's just not the case. And I gotta say, it's not our fault as parents that we get lulled into this thing from the doctors. Mm -hmm. It's not our fault. Um, because they act like, oh, it is that, and we don't know. But I'm just saying that now we're here with someone who knows better that we need to pay attention. The first time I really saw, oh, I better pay better attention, 
was when my son was in preschool and he got the flu. And another little boy <clears throat> who sat next to him in his Fun for Fours class that yeah. was inclusive class, this little boy did not have autism, sat next to my son, he got the same flu, same day. Like they interchanged, right? And they both got dehydrated and yep. we took both of them to the emergency room on the same evening. We weren't wow. there at the same time, but we saw the same doctor. So that's as close as you can <coughs> get. They had the same yeah, exact symptoms. Absolutely. Although gems were a little bit more severe. They had talked about taking him to another hospital. His were that severe. The other little boy got IV fluids and they sent him home. They sent us home, no IV fluids. The wow. other little boy was back wow. to school the next day you know, like three days later, and Jem missed two weeks of school. And later on, I was like, why did this happen? And I even went back and said, why like sent a they, message yeah. to the doctor, I'm curious. And he said, oh, I can tell you exactly why we didn't give your son IV fluids, because he had autism. And you disclosed that to me, and it's really hard for kids with autism to do the IV, they pull it out. And so I, we made the decision, and I was like, Okay. Wow. Wow. Now I need wow. now I know we're playing in a different playing field yeah. and I know that I got to advocate <clears throat> for my child yep. better. Yep. And then I got to tell them what's possible and what's because they're going to assume. Yeah. And I got to do a better job because my kid lost 2 weeks of preschool. Yeah. yeah. Because this doctor assumed assumed that my child couldn't handle the metal, medical intervention that was best for him mm -hmm. and so denied it to totally him. Totally right. Right. So, um, yeah. Amazing. So we need to be mindful. We need to be watching. If we also see that we get to a point in the ABA where maybe we're a little bit stuck, we haven't made any right. progress, is right. that another time that we should be looking at? Absolutely. And thanks for saying that. Definitely. When there's a plateau, you want to start. I mean, the typical thing that you do when there is a plateau, because with ABA, the assumption is that it works with everyone. So. If things are plateauing and not moving forward, something else is going on. You've mm -hmm. got to figure out what that is. And so then that's when you also should go back and look at your checklist. Yeah. Did he sleep? Was he sick? Was there some other traumatic yeah. event? Was some infringement of the diet? Yeah. You did a talk uh, that we, we, you know, I sat there with you and advanced the slides. It wasn't like we did it together, but we acted like it was together. It was no, her. it was. Uh, <laughs> but about what am I missing yeah, was the title yeah, of it. And yeah. I think at some point we should do that. We should review it. We have it. a thing coming up that maybe we should do that oh, for. Okay. Um, that uh, because it was really, really helpful. It was all the different areas that where if things aren't cooking with gas in each area, yep. it's a place to look Definitely. and more place to fodder to find more progress. Absolutely. Okay, let's get to some of these questions. First of all, we're saying good morning to Judy and to Anita from India. <coughs> so glad to have you here. Beck's mama wrote in and said, hi, Dr. Doreen. I have a question concerning a child. She wrote in later and said is four years old, uh, uh, does have a diagnosis and is nonverbal, has a few words, can say ABCs, but hums a lot. Will humming stop if language is developed? And another person, Ms. Hellraiser, asked <laughs> if uh, she has tried a uh, probiotic. And look, Amanda with her blue hearts is here. Hi, Amanda. And Michelle is here. We'll get to your question in just a second. Uh, yeah, uh, I think there's a way. I don't, I don't think I can like your comment from here, but I'll find a way to like that. But let's... Um, yeah, so can, uh, will the humming stop if language yes. develops? Maybe. And it'll definitely, I mean, any kind of behavior, like we're talking about humming, again, you have to ask yourself, like, what is the function of that behavior? Why is the child humming? It could be a, a lot of different things. I've seen children hum because they're just copying something from TV, and they're doing that because they think it's a way to interact. So it's a form of interaction. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or it could be that the child is doing that because they have some sensory issues with their hearing. A lot of kids who have very sensitive hearing hum all the time. It's almost like they're producing white noise, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. that it kind of like, uh, you know, reduces the effect of other sudden noises that are occurring in their environment. So it really, my answer, I guess, is maybe uh, it'll reduce just by learning language. But you can shape the humming to, on its own to be uh, less frequent. And um, that is, you know, you basically allow the child to hum. And you might even want to turn the humming into other things like singing or 
uh, you know, play music so the child is humming along with the music, those types of things, but limit it to a certain time frame of the day. Like you go into music class, that's where it's appropriate for all of us to sing or hum, right? Um, and then when we're in other settings, then no, the humming has to stop. Uh, again, it, one of the things you're asking, which is great, is like, will, can we reduce humming by replacing it with language? And certainly any kind of differential reinforcement of an incompatible behavior, this is called DRI, um, does work. That means you can't hum and talk at the same time. A lot of times we used to have kids who would hum a lot and you know, when you're humming, you're kind of like not hearing everything else. Uh -huh. And so we wanted to stop them. <clears throat> so we would actually stop them and have them, let's say, sing out the ABC or something like yeah. that because it's incompatible. Um, so, yeah, you'll have to see. But one way or another, I think you should start to reducing uh, the time frames that humming is allowed, right? And also, uh, you can... Start playing with uh, noise-canceling headphones. Mm -hmm. Kids who hum, I have found that when you put noise-canceling headphones on with, let's say, music or something else that's entertaining, the humming goes away, um, which is kind of interesting because the humming then that tells me that it's the function of it has something to do with what they're hearing and not with what they're producing. Yeah. Interesting. She did write back and say, I have noticed a lot of times he hums when he's bored or sleepy okay. and he's never had an ear infection, which is great. Congratulations yeah. Yeah. on that. Well, he's also, you know, like that's great that you wrote that. He's trying to entertain himself in some ways yeah. too, you know. There is a vibration both close to the vagus nerve and in your head sometimes. I know uh, my doctor tells me that humming is good for reduction in anxiety. Yeah. Uh, because it's close to the vagus nerves, nerve. But I, but I think it's different for everybody. But I, I do want to put in your backpack, because I know sometimes you just need that hope that this isn't going to be forever. No, but also, it, yeah, absolutely. We don't want to, like, depress you about it. But I yeah. want to say that humming when you're bored, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Like, I hum all the time. My parents, my, my do children tell me that I hum continuously, right? I've never heard you hum. Right, because when I'm here, we're working and doing stuff, right? Yeah. When I'm home, like if I'm washing dishes or cleaning up You're or whatever, humming? I am constantly humming, right? Now but I want to know what she hums. How I about hum the rest different of you? Is songs. Is it Genesis? Is it Genesis <laughs> that you're humming Genesis all the time? Genesis is too hard to hum. Okay, all but, right. But that's the thing. Like, it's, there's nothing wrong with entertaining yourself by humming, right? It becomes a problem if the humming interferes with other things like language. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. Very cool. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hellraiser has said, my son is 11 years old and his language is getting so much better. And they are saying that they highly recommend omega-3. Have you mm -hmm. found that to be useful for some so of our kids? Omega-3s or fish oils are generally very useful for memory. Um, and cognitive functioning. So I, it's one of the supplements that I usually recommend anyway. I think it's very healthy for all of us to be on omega-3s. But again, like my perspective is that our children, and this is my perspective, is that our kids have fallen behind on certain skills, for instance, language. And we need to teach those skills and taking supplements and other types of intervention like probiotics, everything has its own reason. Probiotics are very necessary in our environment now, given our food source is so bad. Uh, so probiotics are absolutely necessary in order to maintain a healthy gut flora. Um, I think omega-3s are very, very helpful because we're not getting enough of what we need nutritionally from our food. So those types of things are, are very supportive, but I do think that in addition to those types of things, you need to have interventions that are focused on the area that you want to focus on, language, for instance. There we go. Uh, Renee, I'm so glad that you were able to join us. I had Traven send you what you asked. Um, could you discuss okay. the use of res respital as a treatment for a four-year-old, uh, minimally verbal boy yeah. who has great trouble focusing? I heard yeah. you sigh. Yeah, I did sigh because <laughs> I, for many years, I was kind of not a big fan of Risperdal. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. Uh, Risperdal is an antipsychotic, right? And 
is one of the very, very few medications that are actually approved for autism, yeah. which it, it's like it bothers me because what Risperdal does is I think it kind of numbs the responses of a child. So yes, generally speaking, when you have a child or an adult who is, um, let's say, you know, very severely uh, affected by autism and, uh, you know, so far uh, has been affected for such a long period of time that the intensity has increased and they're no longer able to really communicate or express what is frustrating them, then yeah, I, I mean, I can see a use for Risperdal, which is kind of more very calm. Let's calm you down so that f we can figure out what's going on, okay? Mm -hmm. But when I look at younger kids, I have a really hard time with Risperdal. Um, currently, I'm in the process of helping a child come off Risperdal. He's been on Risperdal for three years, I believe, mm -hmm. and you know, when you come off Risperdal, there's a very big risk of other types of neurological issues developing, yeah. so you have to come off very, very slowly. Um, that being said, I, I'm not a big fan of it in general because I feel like every uh, behavioral expression that a child has um, has a reason. And if we numb that, if we just you know, put a medication there that kind of turns, you know, uh, makes the child not respond, mm -hmm. then we are not able to figure out what the child is trying to communicate. Yeah. And if it's an attention issue, Risperdal is not the way to go. You're looking now at th the variety, and there's tons of medications for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Some of these medications will also affect the hyperactivity. Other ones will just affect attention. Um, and I think that you definitely need to be talking to a good neuro pediatric neurologist who can help you select the medication that will help your child stay more focused. There's a lot of behavioral tricks we do for that as well, but if you're looking for medical, that's the direction to go, not necessarily Risperdal. And I, I, I kind of want to hug you because mm -hmm. I love what your answer was. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what I have heard from so many experts um, yeah. over the years doing Autism Live is that, um, that it's the kind of thing that it should be the last or next to the last resort. Like yeah. try everything else yeah. first. Yeah. And yeah. for like as much as you probably feel like you've tried everything under the sun, very likely you haven't. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, and that it might be w well, well worth it to look at a whole bunch of other things first. I always like to throw in there the going as pesticide free as possible. It, <clears throat> definitely, and we should probably talk about that for a minute as well. Uh, the food aspects altogether, whether, and it's a variety of things having mm -hmm. to do with the food, and thanks for reminding me of that again, because I have to. You know, there's so many factors, right, that you have well, to Well, really you're thinking watch. of it like a doctor. I'm thinking of it like a mother. No, Do you know what I mean? And so that's why it comes no, up first for me. I mean, right now, like this child that I'm working with right now, mm -hmm. you know, we did, we were on a gluten-free, casein-free, corn, soy-free diet for a little while, and his hyperactivity and attention issues had reduced, mm -hmm. but not significantly enough for mom to feel like, okay, this is worth it. Got it. And so, and this happens very often, yeah. right, where mom and dad are like at they've done they're ha they've had it and they yeah. kind of want to just like move on and uh, reintroduce the normal diet because it makes everybody's life so much easier to be on a typical diet right yeah. and so and we the therapeutic team I guess they all see differences with his diet and going back to diet of obviously there's pesticides that are affecting us in our food there's no question about that then there's also food coloring that yep. will alter things. There's sugar. And again, even if it's a mild reaction, the reaction to gluten and casein could also be interfering with this. Yeah, absolutely. So please, you know, see what else you can do. Um, Dark Angel, hi. Do hi, Dr. Doreen. My son has started saying real words, real words randomly since December, and he still does it every day. And with a new word or repeat what he said previously, it is not functional, but what does that mean? 
He's so, like the word of the day. Yeah, and I love it. <laughs> so I don't know what it means because I don't know exactly under what circumstances, but I'm wondering if he's picking things up from his environment somehow. So he might be picking up things from TV, for instance, mm -hmm. or hearing other people say those words. And a lot of times our kids are actually trying to communicate. Yeah. And they just don't really understand the, how, you know, how do words help us communicate? So they throw out these words and they don't realize that the word has to have some functional use or fit into the context or something like that. What I would do is I would first of all try to figure out where is he getting these words from? Um, and secondly, I would try to turn the word, I, I don't know, I don't remember now, uh, uh, Dark Angel, I f forgive me, for um, like the level of uh, communication that your child has. But if it's possible to turn it into some form of communication, like when he says the word, talk about the word, uh, you know, describe the word, have him describe the word, show him the word, whatever it is that you can turn it into more than just a repeat, then uh, I think that's probably the way to go. She says he doesn't watch TV and the words are in French. But I believe that you are <laughs> in know. Canada, so it would not be crazy to think that people around him are speaking French. Well, it depends on where you are in Canada. I didn't know that you were in Canada, actually. But okay, um, <laughs> I love that his words are in French. So you I know? had another child who actually, this is very, and I, I got to tell you, he might be trying to learn something on his own, which is totally something that happens as well. I had another child who would literally take her iPad mm -hmm. and would change the language on there mm -hmm. so that she could watch the same shows, but in a different language. And how old was this child? She was, when she used to do that, and she's an adult now, but when she used to do that, I think she was like five. That's amazing. She was very, very young. And, and mom and I would always be like, is she trying to learn a new language? Like, what is she like, doing? People should never say that our kids are not amazing. Oh our kids gosh. are amazing. Oh, my gosh. I know that sometimes it comes with a bag of very interesting, con you know, confluence of things that are not always fun, but our kids are amazing. Uh, she says, I speak to him in French, and we speak English oh, okay. home, and we are in an English uh, province. So he's, he's trying to communicate with you. If you speak to him in French, and he's blurting out French words, he's trying to communicate with you. What a beautiful thing. Yeah. That's amazing. Absolutely. That's my sister-in-law, Christy Goat Adams. Hi, Christy. Do you see her <laughs> there? No, I'm not seeing right her. Right after, um, she's in the middle there. Okay. Sending me hearts. Okay. All right. I didn't see that because I've, I've skipped ahead a little bit because we were, were having that live conversation. Um, okay. So uh, Beck's mom said thank you so much. There, I see it now. Uh, but Dark Angel did also ask, does brain function ever get better for our kids? And I loved that uh, Ms. Hells Hellraiser responded and said, absolutely, it does with therapy and proper nutrition and a parent that never gives up. Amen to that answer. Oh, for sure. That's a great answer. <clears throat> and you have to realize, you guys, that, um, you know, one of the, th you know, when we talk about language acquisition, just in neurotypical people as well, the uh, period of time that we have what's called very, very high brain plasticity is between ages four and seven. And what that means, and that's why it's like if a child is exposed to another language prior to age seven, continuously between four and seven, then it becomes a very fluent uh, uh, language for them. Why? That's because that period of time is when, and by the way, going back to the fish oils helps this issue as well. That is when your nerve cells, your neurons, are able to readily grow new dendrites. So, mm. you know, a, a, a neuron looks like kind of a tree with roots. I'm talking about trees again. Yes, and I heard that. And the roots are called dendrites, right? And, and the more of these, the more dense that area is of, of roots, the more... And now I'm getting too technical. These, n the more neural circuits you're developing, that means that like the child will have more ability to respond to different situations and more flexibility and more connections to other types of brain functions and so on. These are just connections that are occurring. So yeah, absolutely. And that's why we say that you're supposed to do very intensive work in the first in the earlier part of yeah. life because the older you get, what happens, sadly, 
is that after a certain age, those dendrites that are not used just die off. Yeah, and they self-prune. So yeah, they self-prune. And they, they literally call it pruning. Exactly. So. And that's why they say that, you know, if you want your mind to remain sharp in your older age as you become yeah. a senior, do things that involve brain activity. And that will allow your kind of nerve cells not to self-prune. There we go. Now, Amanda, who we haven't heard from in a while, but I'm so thrilled that she's here, has written in. And Amanda, this is just more evidence that you and I are sisters from another mother. Uh, she says, my son doesn't hum, uh, but he does make some noises mm -hmm. now. I am finally able to ask him, and he gives me answers as to what, he, what he's doing. Like he'll say, I'm thinking about jump scares yes, on Five perfect. Nights at Freddy. Wonderful. That is a video game that he's really into. He plays it one hour a day, but I'm just happy he's able to tell me exactly. why he's doing the noises and hand flapping now. He didn't used to be able to tell me why. Exactly. How amazing. And that's, it's, I love that, Amanda, because I, it kind of makes me feel very good because years and years ago, I, many, many years ago, we're talking like 30 years ago, I remember thinking with one of my kids, why does he talk about these things? And then I realized that all kids do this, right? Except neurotypical kids will give an introductory phrase yes. about what they're thinking, yes. and and then it makes it completely fine, yes. right? If I just blurt out something that I, without giving an introduction about where I thought or what I'm yeah. thinking, or you know something as simple as like I saw blah 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 on TV yesterday, and then I can talk about it. Yep, that really just makes it puts it in context, and that's. Perfect. Yeah. There's a great documentary, if you are not familiar with this, but Life Animated, which is Ron Suskin's family yes. talking about his child on the spectrum who would always do these quotes from Disney movies that were, that they, eventually they just gave up and they were like, well, he's never going to speak. He just says these quotes from Disney movies and it's just this thing. And they kind of ignored it mm -hmm. until one day, and I don't want to give it away, watch the documentary, but they realize it is not him just saying these things it becomes clear that he is using it as a yeah. form of communication and then what changed as a result of when somebody is communicating to you and you don't realize that they're communicating and you're ignoring it yeah when it changes and you orient to it like phew, what yeah. happens yeah. it's crazy good life animated it was nominated for an oscar oh it was a great film it did i not actually win, met but, him too oh did you how yes. Well, we interviewed, yeah. we had the mom on the on the show at one point. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, I, I loved that movie. It was very good. Yeah, very well done. Um, okay, so congratulations, Amanda. I wish I had known that your son was into Five Nights at Freddy's because Funko was very generous with us for uh, Sensitive Santa and had given us oh. a bunch of Five Nights at Freddy's things. And you can't give that to every child because yeah, it's yeah. a little scary. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I was like, all right, who's into Five Nights of Red? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and I don't think we have any left, but I'll check and see. Uh, okay. Uh, Suyan has written in, and it's a little, it's segmented, so I'm going to try to read through all of it. Hi, Doreen and Shannon. My son is three years old, and he has tongue tie. He had a very good pronunciation with singing lots of songs before 33 months. Um, they go on to say his pronunciation was getting worse after experiencing severe vocal stimming. Uh, said same sound every five minutes for two months at, for, at three to 34 to 36 months. He stopped vocal stimming, but I am so concerned with his pronunci pron pronunciation, I don't know what happened with his brain. My question is, does tongue tie impede his speech as growing? It has, was not a problem in my son's earlier years. Can you give any tips for recovering from the tongue tie surgery? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the whole uh, you know, reason there is a surgery is that it does impede language. Yeah. So uh, I would recommend that you move forward with that. It will become harder for him to... You know, just imagine, uh, as, as I'm speaking, if I just uh, focus for a moment on my tongue, right? When you guys are talking, just focus for a moment. Pay attention, because it becomes such a normal thing, we don't think about it. Yeah. Pay attention to your tongue. It moves in a million directions in order to produce language sounds. So uh, the fact that it is connected in a way that it is harder for him to move it, yes, it's, it's an issue. Now, how to get over the surgery, 
you know, our kids are very resilient. It is difficult. Any child would have a difficult time coming over a surgery or overcoming a surgery, but I'm sure he will come over it. And uh, it's just something that you have to kind of take care of and get it over with. And honestly, the sooner the better, because the younger the child is, the, the more malleable they are and the faster they'll get over anything that is of a surgical nature or, or pain related. Yeah, and uh, Amanda wrote in and said that her son had to have the, that surgery at 11, okay. and, and she says do it. Uh, and so maybe you can have a conversation with her <coughs> about what that's like so that you know parent to parent what that is like. And Amanda is always so wonderful about sharing her experience. Uh, okay, I, I wanted to acknowledge that Ms. Hellraiser said that uh, when we were having the conversation about Respidol, said I refused all medical treatments. Uh, I'm happy that I've made that choice for my boy. Others may have a different opinion. And I think it is very personal, but I think mm -hmm. a lot of us uh, <coughs> feel that we want to do other things. <coughs> Renee wants to know, what about stem cell therapy? Do you have anything that you want to say about <coughs> stem yeah. cell? I actually did recently, like last year I think it was, um, <coughs> an episode of The Doctor's Show where we talked about this, the stem cell interventions that exist. And unfortunately, it's a little too early in the development of stem cell therapies. I don't think we're at that phase yet um, where it is showing, you know, remarkable change. There are a few families who say that it did make a big impact for mm -hmm. their child, but I don't think that, I think we need to wait a few more years and let stem cell therapies advance a little bit more. Um, having said that, <clears throat> you know, there's, like everything else with autism, it's just beginning to develop and it's something that a lot of parents do believe in. Um, and I think you just need to be a little bit cautious because we're not talking about brain functioning. And, uh, you know, I, I'm looking right now personally to, to for, I'm researching stem cells for things like joints and back pain and that type of thing. And even in that area, um, we're not really advanced enough. So when you're talking about brain functioning for a brain that is still in development, my personal feeling is I would wait because we need to be very sure that this is not going to have other types of repercussions. There we go. Judy has written in and uh, said that they're still working on the dog desensitization that oh. you gave them a couple of years ago. Yes. That they're doing it on their own. And you know, sometimes investing two years in it is what you got to do. Uh, she says that her son is still nonverbal uh -huh. and is now 13 years old. And how do I encourage him to go <clears throat> outside of the house? We're trying all the reinforcers. So, uh, Judy, if he's not going outside of the house, it makes me think that there's something that he's afraid of outside of the house. I mean, generally speaking, when you have agoraphobia, um, there's something that you are afraid of. And it could be a whole variety of things, and you need to really figure that out. Because I love the fact that you're rein trying to reinforce it. Dog. He's afraid of dogs. It's just because of dogs. Okay, yeah. so what you have to do, and, I mean, and you're doing it, which is great. You're trying to uh, kind of get him more familiar or less afraid of dogs on the one hand. On the other hand, I think what you need to do is a little bit more flooding. Flooding is when, like, exposure. So take him, you know, just outside of the door, front door and reinforce him. Take him down, uh, give him his A reinforcer that he would only get for going outside. He will not have this reward under any other conditions, right? So outside the front door, down the walkway to the house, let's say, down the walkway and into the car. So, and you know, write this out in a series of 12, 13, 14 steps so that you can keep yourself going. I don't want you to be working on this like two years down the line, right? Because So give yourself a, a series of accomplishments, uh, goals, right? Like objectives. So I will by, you know, this month, I will be getting him outside the door and uh, down the walkway. And you just focus on that for the next four weeks and then I will do that and get him in the car. I will do that and get him in the car. 
And, and while you're working on that, you have this other thing, which is exposure to dogs, and that's the systematic desensitization. Now, I don't remember what I advised you a few years ago, but it would have probably been the best way to get over a phobia is systematic desensitization, which is kind of the same thing where you write a series of steps that have to do with closer and closer exposure to the actual fear evoking object and you pair those with relaxation. So for instance, uh, I look at a picture of a dog and now I, as I have the picture in front of me, I will do breathing exercises and calm down and really get relaxed. Okay, now I've passed that stage, I'm gonna look at, let's say, a video of a dog um, and I can actually look at dogs on TV and I'll be fine. Um, I can sit inside a room and have a dog outside, a small dog outside the window and I'll be fine. So it's, it's like this whole exposure to the point where you eventually get to the point where you can actually have exposure to a dog um, and maybe even pet the dog, right? Now it is normal, a lot of people are afraid of scary dogs, like you know, big dogs, pit bulls, rottweilers, so on, so let's not go that far. But let's try to get him to the point where he is comfortable, at least around smaller dogs. And at the same time, as you're getting him comfortable to dogs, you're also urging him to just take another step outside of the door. You're smiling. She wrote in and said he loves Gus Lottery, will ride for billboards and notices when they've changed. He's very smart. I'm not 100% sure what Gus Lot Lottery is. But it sounds like that's his currency, that he wants to go yeah. out of the house to see, to see the billboard change, which, I, again, I just love our kids. I love I that that's his thing. Exactly. Okay, so I have this really outlandish, this is where my mind goes, and you have to tell me whether I'm completely nuts and I need to be thrown out of the studio. Okay. But, like, I'm, I'm guessing that at some point a dog barked at him or charged at him or whatever. Something, yeah. And so... Or, my, or that he saw something like that on TV. Right. So my... My thing is like, what would make him feel protected, that he could be outside and be protected? And the first thing that I went to is, you know how they have those blow up costumes yeah. that go around you, like the dinosaur ones and the sumo wrestler sure. things? And then they have the ones that eventually your head is out, but it's blown up around, like there's a dinosaur around you yes. and it looks like you're riding on it. Yeah. Like, would it be crazy to try Honestly, that with this child? No, but anything, I think, you should try everything, right? You should yeah. try anything that's going to make him feel more secure. I mean, the natural reaction when you see a child who's scared of dogs is, what do they do? They run behind their parents. Yes. So you want to make sure you're always available for him. I think size really matters in this case, yeah. size of the stimulus. So if you have a friend or someone who, let's say, has a very small chihuahua, yeah. exposure to that dog would be helpful. But not if, you know, some chihuahuas are like, yeah. like a good, a good chihuahua, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but see, that's the thing. The, and separate. To begin with. To begin well, with. separate barking yeah. from biting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. barking is not going to be, unless he's extremely sound sensitive, you need to figure out what it is about dogs that, that he's so terrified of. Yeah. You know, and then gradually expose him to that particular feature. It's hard. It is not easy. Uh, she says, yes, my neighbor babysits never know when he had a, a dog when younger. Interesting. I also wonder too, you know, like there are certain maneuvers that, I, and maybe you've taught this to him already, that there are things, when dogs jump up, there's a thing that we've all learned from mm -hmm. what's Caesar Milan uh, about how you pull, you just pull your knee up. Yeah. You don't have to fight with the dog, you just pull your knee up and the dog instantly doesn't yep. like that. Yep. There are other, I know somebody in my neighborhood who walks around with a spray bottle and if a dog comes <laughs> near them, they spray the dog and dogs don't like to be sprayed in the face. Right, right. They, even like nasty dogs will back up and be like, hey, what was that? What was that? Um, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, somebody, help, Ms. Ms. Hellraiser said, we overcame a dog fear. He was mauled, I, th mauled, oh I think, gosh. by a Great Dane, and we spent three years being absolutely <sighs> terrified. Oh, yeah, yeah. he'd run into traffic to get away from a dog. Yeah. We got a, a staffy last year, and he's totally fine. Interesting mm -hmm. that having their own dog yeah. uh, helped a little bit with that. And Judy said, thank you that they'll, they'll keep us updated. Uh, we had another question from Beck's mom, and I wanted to go back. I don't know. Uh, well, uh, here it is. Uh, they said, um, 
Another question is, how do I get my four-year-old to do number two in the toilet? Yeah. He's good at standing to pee, just won't do the number two. He goes to get me to pull, get a pull-up so he can go into that. He doesn't have a problem sitting on the toilet. He just won't go. Yeah. So it's actually, uh, that's really, really common, and you're already kind of mid-process uh, here. Because he thinks that he is only supposed to go in the pull-up. I don't know how our kids get this idea, but they do a lot. It's very frequent that they think, and maybe it's the contact with their body of some, whatever. They get used to the idea that they, I have to have a pull-up on in order to go. So, you know, it's you can, you gradually have to teach him that the, who doesn't go in, shouldn't just go in the pull-up, it should actually go in the toilet. Now there's a number of different ways you could do that. You can give him the pull-ups, have him go, but then physically help him take the pull-up and empty it into the toilet. So he, and then really celebrate that so that he understands that that's where it's supposed to go and flush it and yay, we did such yeah. a good job. Another thing that actually I got this from a parent who had started to cut the bottom of the pull-up mm -hmm. so that there was actually a hole in the pull-up. They would put the whole pull-up on, but there was a hole, yeah. there was a pretty big hole. Yeah. And so then with the pull-up, they would go and sit on the toilet and void. And then gradually the hole became bigger and bigger to the point where the pull-up was almost like just a belt. And then it was gone. Yeah. So, you know, you can do that as well. But I think it's you're, you're halfway there. You're almost there. And it's just for the child is, like, not getting the message that it's okay to void in the toilet. Remember, a lot of kids are afraid of the toilet. They're like, where did this, where is that hole? And where does it go? Because the whole concept of, like, you know, sewage and so on hasn't developed yet. And kids get scared of that because they think like they're going to fall in and get sucked away. So you kind of have to gradually expose them and make sure that he's okay with that. She said they have been doing the dumping the, the poo in, but she says, ooh, I will definitely try that cutting the hole in the pull-up. <laughs> okay. uh, love that. Uh, Dark Angel said that their child was afraid of dogs too and that it does get better and lots of exposure. Uh, love, love, love that. Renee wants to know any ideas on how to convince my grandchild's parents they are discouraged. So, so they're the grandparent, and the parents of the child are discouraged at his lack of progress and are afraid oh. that they will miss the window for teaching him necessary skills and oh. language. So yeah. hard. It is. We all fear hard. that. Very, very hard. And I guess there's, I want to say there's two sides to this. One is... You know, just remember that they're human as well and they need yeah. reinforcers as well, right? So it's very natural for them to be discouraged and that's just a part of what happens. And you need to just, uh, I guess, maybe one thing you can do is videotape when the child is with <coughs> you doing awesome things and show that to the parents again and again and say, look at what he's doing and he didn't used to do this. Look at what he's doing and he didn't used to, like... Just keep reminding them of the wonderful things that he has learned to do. The other side of the coin here is if he's not progressing fast enough, let's figure out why, right? Again, um, this is, these are one of those situations where I do want parents to be persistent because ABA takes a long time. But at the same time, there are, you, you want to make sure is he sleeping well? Is his diet good? Are there attention issues that are interfering? Are there sensory issues that are interfering? One of the biggest things for me is sensory input, right? Is the child actually receiving visual input correctly? Does he perhaps need to have his eyes checked? Is he receiving auditory feedback, noises and sounds like the way we do? Is he hearing properly? Check all of that because sometimes uh, diet, diet is a big one. If you uh, sometimes I see with parents who are just getting to the point of disappointment and they do like one slight change on the diet and it's like all of a sudden the rate of acquisition increases. So check all of those types of things. Is the ABA high quality? That's another one that you want to check because sometimes we expect our kids to learn stuff and you look at the ABA and you're like, I wouldn't learn. That's extremely wrong and confusing. So. All of those things matter, I guess. And I know it's very hard for a grandparent to 
figure all of that out, but that's at least a conversation you can have with the parents and say, listen, let's not cut all therapies. Let's figure out what else could be interfering with his learning. And I'm simply going to say to you, make sure that you tell them on a regular base, basis that they are good parents. Yes. And, and defer to them. Yes. I'm, yes. Sh I'm sure yes. that, like, I, I have this experience with friends, and it's like I want to get in there and do it myself because I want to do whatever. And sometimes you, your job is just to say, you're awesome. I believe in you. Yes. They're going to be okay because you're an awesome parent. Yes. And that that does more for them than anything else that you can do. I've got two questions that I want to squeeze in before we're done. Ah. Uh, Amanda wants to know, do you have any opinions on teaching boys to stand up to pee versus sitting down? ABA originally taught my son to sit down, so that's what he does. But times have changed. I had another BCBA tell me that I need to teach him to, uh, to do it standing up. She made some valid points. So now I'm wondering, do I need to go that route, route now? He's 14. No, no. This is a very personal uh, family choice. So I would just go with what he knows. Um, but I mean, if there's another reason that you absolutely want to teach him to stand, uh, then you have to do that. But I know that there are grown men who go bo either way. Yep, so. yep, 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 yep. Uh, Ms. Hellraiser wants to know, any suggestions on how to stop headbanging? Mm. It's decreased 70% in the last three years. That's ginormous, but we haven't been able to extinguish it completely. Oh my gosh, so this is a really important area. And um, there's a difference between what we call SIB, SIB, self-injurious behavior, and uh, attention-seeking behavior. So is the head, if the headbanging is occurring when he is completely alone and no demands have been placed on him at all, then it is self-injurious behavior. And this is when you need to go and actually talk to a a neurologist and try to get medication and figure out if he has he headaches that are occurring um, or if he has if he is seeking out more sensory input as in needs a head massage regularly or some sort of stimulation on his scalp that would help him uh, stop seeking it out through head banging that's a medical issue okay Otherwise, sometimes our kids will headbang because headbanging freaks the parents out. Mm -hmm. And the par everyone, teachers, parents, everybody freaks out and backs off. So if you tell me to do something I don't really want to do and I bang my head and then you are like, oh my God, I better leave him alone, then I learn that every time I headbang, people will back off and not force me to do something I don't want to do. And that is, a, is more of a uh, manipulative type of behavior, so, and it's smart. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying manipulative in a bad way, it's very smart. It's we figure out that we can do certain things to get other people to leave us alone, or we can do certain things to get attention. Like, I want mom to come over and spend time with me as opposed to my sibling. So I'm going to headbang, and when I headbang, mom comes over and holds me for a little while. So it really has to do with what is going on around the head banging. They say when he's frustrated. Yeah, so there you go. So he's frustrated. What he's trying to say, what would he say if he didn't head bang? If he was vocal, if he was neurotypical, what would he say when he's frustrated? I don't want to do this right now. Or I need a break. Or this is too hard. Whatever that utterance is, you teach him to say that. And when he says that, you back off and give him a break, okay? When he headbangs, you don't back off and give him a break. In other words, what you're saying is the headbanging is not going to work as a form of communication. Language is going to work as a form of communication. And that's essentially what we do always when we have challenging behaviors. Uh, two last things. Dozer wrote in and said, I'm late, but I just want to let Dr. Doreen know that I bought her book. I'm soaking it up like a sponge. I have parent training in ABA, but it's nothing like the info in this book. Oh, that's book. awesome. That I'm amazing? so glad to hear it. And I know we have to end, but can I just say that I actually, over the holidays, made quite a bit of progress on... I. 
switched mid mid gear. I was writing a book more on like kind of ABA techniques and all mm -hmm. that sort of stuff, and then I switched, and I'm really heavily now getting involved in this other book, which is um, I thought it would be very important for families to see like just stories of individuals mm. who have recovered from yeah. more and I don't I myself don't want to really use the word recovered but have overcome the difficulties of autism right yes. and so this book is going to be a chapter each of lots of kids I, uh. I think I have like 11 so far wow. who would who where they are answering questions and their parents are answering questions love it and I think that'll be something fun so, but I need help with the title Oh, okay. So maybe our audience can help us throw okay. out some title suggestions. Wonderful. I also do want to say that Renee wrote back in and said that the difficulties with the child, that, uh, with the concern about the progress, she wrote PICA, which is a whole other thing. It's a very different thing. And with PICA, you really should be talking, I think, to a functional medicine doctor, figure out if there are nutritional deficiencies that need to be addressed. And then we can talk about how to address it behaviorally and stop it. But usually with pica, kids are eating things that are non-edible. And a lot of times it's because they're lacking in some nutritional area. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, the Fortune says, do you see patients in person? And occasionally she does. Uh, but yeah. not as much anymore. You're in different phase in your life. Uh, but you can write to me if you want more questions about that, Shannon at autism-live.com. We've gone over now, uh, so we do have to end the program, but there will be more Ask Dr. Doreen coming your way. Don't forget to check her out on TikTok. Instagram, and Instagram Facebook, all over. And all now we're starting today. Uh, this weekend I started YouTube again, oh. although all of Autism Live and all of yep. these shows are on YouTube as well, and all of these are segmented. Thank you to Traven and Wonderful. where you, they answer questions. But uh, I started a whole new thing, which is kind of like watching TV series and commenting on them. Oh, yes. So I started watching um, The Good Doctor. Oh, yeah, okay. Kind of fun. That's a lot of fun. All right. We'll check that out. All right, you guys. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. But guess who's on the show tomorrow? Tell me. Christina Adams oh, is with us awesome. tomorrow. Christina Adams, who's the author of the book A Real Boy, uh, which was my Bible, personally, to oh, start good. ABA therapy. And that's how I got started. And now she's also the author of Camel Crazy because she has gone completely camel crazy. She's going to tell us why. <laughs> and we're going to talk about some new research that's out. Then on Thursday, we have Let's Talk Movies. Oh, okay, uh, good. Lots of things that we're going to be talking about. Don't ask me to talk about Tar because I'll start throwing things. Um, <laughs> have you seen it? No. Don't. I'm just saying. Okay. But, um, but go see <laughs> RRR. Okay. Has Sunny watched RRR yet? No. Oh, Ladies and gentlemen, RRR, you heard it here. Um, Traven's the one who turned me on to it. It's the best thing ever. Okay. So uh, we'll be talking about those kinds of things on uh, Thursday. You want to tune in for that. And guess what's happening on Friday? We have a brand new episode of Stories from the Spectrum. Oh, wow. And there's some really good stuff in it, you guys. I think you're going to love it. It's That's a brand awesome. new premiere. Sign up for the time so you don't miss it. Uh, what time tomorrow? Same time, same bat channel. Uh, we're always here at 10 a.m. Pacific time, which is 1 p.m. Eastern time. Please do the math wherever you are because I'm not good at that. All right. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you, too. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Don't forget, you can watch Ask Dr. Doreen live every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And we hope to see you there.